If you've been paying attention as we've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes, there's been a, a common refrain that's repeated itself over and over and over again. And that refrain is the, the phrase, under the sun. So far, uh, through eight chapters, now into chapter nine, uh, we've seen that, that phrase occur 21 times in the book. In total, in the book, it, it turns out to be 26 times. So as you think about that phrase, under the sun, 26 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, and in fact, it's, it's not used anywhere else in the Bible. The author uses this phrase, under the sun. What's he talking about with it? Well, what he's talking about with it is he's saying, look, this life, everything that's lived here, the, the relationships that you have, the career that you pursue, your education, your wealth, your status, your power, your fame, everything else, all of that exists under the sun. And those things that exist under the sun as he opened up with that opening indictment in chapter one are vanity. Vanity of vanity, all is vanities. All there refers to everything that's being done under the sun. And so far we've indicted all of that and we've talked about all that. And you're like, okay, yeah, I get that. I've, I've been there. I've heard about these things that I shouldn't live for this. I shouldn't live for this. I shouldn't put all my hope here. I shouldn't put all my hope here because if I do, it's gonna disappoint me. It can't transcend death. And vanity of vanity, all is vanity. But here's where the, the pivot happens a little bit with this phrase this week is that is Solomon's writing to confront us again with the hopelessness of life under the sun in order for us to be able to get over the sun. In order for us to, to look beyond this life, to look above and beyond what happens here in this world and this earth and to realize there's something more out there. There's something bigger. There's something better that we need to be aware of. And Solomon's going to help us understand that and lay out what that looks like for us in the passage that we're going to read together this week. Let's start in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and read verses 1 through 6. Solomon says this, But all of this I laid to heart. So everything that he's been talking about. You can tell he's kind of leading in. We've only got four chapters left in the book. And he's beginning to lead into his conclusion here. He's, I, I laid all of this to heart. I took it to heart. I pondered it. I considered it. I turned it over in my mind. All of this I laid to heart, examining it all. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in the hand of God. Whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. It's the same for all, since the same event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good and the evil to the clean and the unclean, to him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. As the good one is, so is the sinner. As he who swears is as he who shuns an oath. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all. Also, the hearts of the children of man are full of evil and madness is in their hearts while they live and after that they go to the dead. But he who is joined with all the living has hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward. For the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. These first six verses open up, and you probably picked up on the theme of them. It's a similar theme that we've covered previously in the book, that death is coming. Great. Another message about how death is inevitable. Well, number one, I would say yes, and that should stick out to us, that in a book that's inspired by God, that's, the words are breathed out by God, that he has focused so much time on the inevitability of death. That needs to sink into us. I don't think we can think enough about uh, the end of our life. I think we need to, to, as this whole series has been built around, begin there and then ask ourselves, okay, that's coming it's inevitable. How should we then live? So yes, number one, it is the repeated theme of, of death is inevitable. But number two, it's, it's a theme that now has a, a bit of a pivot to it, as I hinted at or alluded to in the introduction. Solomon's going to be driving us to a different point of view now. And at first he wants us to think, though, that, that this death that happens under the sun, it's, he calls it evil. It's, it's wicked. It's, it's just wrong. It doesn't sit well with Solomon. You pick up some of his frustration here. The death happens to everyone. The de death doesn't care about anything of, of your status or your age or anything else. The death is inevitable and it's indiscriminatory in its nature. He describes it. He says, no one escapes. He says, the righteous and the wicked both die. Loving and hateful both die. Good and evil both die. 
clean or unclean, both die. Devoted or heathen, the one who sacrifices, the one who doesn't sacrifice, both die. Faithful or unfaithful, both die. That person who swears the oath and abides by it or the one that shuns the oath, both die. See, life under the sun, Solomon wants us to see in these first six verses, it, it, it ends for everybody. And that, that unpredictability of death, it, it strikes him as, as a, a cruel just fact about life. It's evil. He's not impugning God here. He's not saying that God is evil. He's just saying that, that, that this reality is, is evil. He's saying it's, it's a, a cruel, unpredictable reality that all die. That death doesn't care, again, about your age, your valor, your wealth, what you've done with your life, your wisdom, your righteousness, your sins, your integrity, or your power. Death is going to come, and when it does, you cannot escape. He says this is the lot for everyone under the sun. Again, under the sun, this world, this tangible, material, physical life that you live, it will come to an end and it will end everything. But the answer to this is is not to become despairing nihilists. Look back at chapter 9, verse 1. How the righteous and the wise and their deeds are, look at the next phrase, in the hand of God. In the hand of God. See, the fact that God is there and that he has all of this in his hands prevents us from just despairing and becoming depressed nihilists about our existence. Man, under the sun, there's nothing in vanity and vanity. See, there's a, a place and a point of view and a perspective that we can embrace as believers in Jesus Christ, as Christians, that says, no, God exists. There's something more than what's under the sun that drives us to get over the sun and that leads us to now live the life that we live here and now with our, our hands around it just loosely, willing to let go because we know that there's something better that transcends this, right? Our first point together this week is this, get over what's under the sun. Get over what's under the sun. All of the the hopes and the dreams and the plans and, and the priorities and everything else that you have right now, it's not that they're bad, but guys, get over it. If it happens, great. Enjoy it and praise God that it happened. But if it doesn't happen, don't anchor your entire hope and existence and joy and satisfaction to those plans coming to fruition because they may not. Death may come before you expect it to come. We need to get over this life and understand that there's a a life over the sun that we all need to be preparing for and living for. See, that, that death that's inevitable, that's unpredictable, that's indiscriminatory, it's an end to everything that you know here and now under the sun. Your family, that relationship's over, done, gone. Your friends, done, gone. Possessions, gone. Education, gone. Job, gone. Dreams, gone. Plans, gone. See, death is is the brick wall to our existence here in this world. We're going to run into it someday, whenever that happens, and there's no getting around it, there's no going through it. It will stop us dead in our tracks as far as life is concerned under the sun. And so Solomon wants us to get over the sun. Look at what he says in verse 4. He said, look, death is coming, and death is a, a cruel thing. Because it's, it's unpredictable and it comes to everybody, no matter who you are, righteous or evil. Uh, it, it happens to the same to all of us. But he says this in verse 4. He says, but he who is joined with all the living has hope. Has hope. In other words, Psalm saying, if you're still alive and you're reading this, praise God, there's reason for hope for you. It's not too late. He says a living dog, I love the way he puts it, a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now you might think to yourself, well, I would rather have a dog than a lion anyways. But they wouldn't. A dog during Solomon's days was a a wretched animal, was a despicable animal. Think about a a coyote or a jackal or a hyena, right? I mean, nobody's going to grab that and be like, yeah, I want that as as my pet. Dog was not man's best friend during Solomon's day. But Solomon's saying, look, a living dog is even better than a dead lion. Why? The lion's the king of beasts, right? Yes, but once the lion is dead, it's no longer the king of beasts. The dog still has breath within him, which makes the dog better than the lion. And so see what Solomon is saying here. He's saying, if you have breath in your body still, there's hope for you. It's better than those that are dead. Look at what he said there. He said, those that are dead, they, they've, they've already gone on. They're, they have no more reward. The memory of them is, is forgotten. They know, he says, nothing there. Their love, their hate, their envy, they've already perished. They're gone. All the things that they've done, it, it, it's gone. It's, it's, it's over. They can't do anything to compensate or to gain reward from that now. And forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. 
So Solomon is, is kind of grabbing us by the, the shirt collar, so to speak, and saying, look, you're alive. Rejoice in that. And now what I want you to do is I want you to get your eyes off of what's under the sun and get over the sun. Get to the life that's coming. Get to the life that transcends this. Live the life that God wants you to. Loosen your grip on the things here and find out what, what really matters. Y'all, Jesus is, is better. He just is. He's better than anything under the sun. So much better. He's better than, than this world. He's better than, than you living your perfect life in every single one of your dreams coming true. Y'all, Jesus is better than that. Jesus is better than a life cut short. A life cut sh short by cancer or by disease or by murder or by a, a car accident. Jesus is better than that life. Jesus is better than just the, 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 the life mired in, in dis depression and disappointment. He's better than despair. He's better than nihilism. He's better than all of those things. Y'all, Jesus is, is better than the, the, the average life in the middle class income bracket, in the track home with the white picket fence and the dog and three and a half kids. Jesus is better than that. Y'all, don't be satisfied for what's under the sun. Don't be broken and crushed by what's under the sun because with both of those, Jesus is better. Get your eyes on Christ. Get your eyes on what's over the sun. Get your eyes on what's better than the life that's here and the life that's now. Don't settle for what's under the sun. Solomon's arguing that and he has been arguing that throughout this whole book. And he's coming back to death because death is the ultimate arbiter there. It's the ultimate judge. It's the ultimate reality check because death ends life under the sun. And he's saying, but you know what? You're still alive right now if you're reading this, if you're hearing this, if you're watching this. And so Solomon's saying for you, there's hope. Hope for what? To live for the things under the sun? No, because that flies in the face of everything he's been talking about. No, hope to get over the sun. Hope to live for what really matters. Death can be the perspective shift that, that we all need. And Solomon's putting it out there for us. It, it, it can be that reminder that there's something so much better than anything this world has to offer us. I, I don't want to boast or brag or anything, but I, I drive a 2013 Toyota Corolla. Um, and I, I, I bought it off the lot with nothing added to it. In fact, I even asked the guy if he could take the floor mats out so I wouldn't have to pay for those. So, you know, it's it's... Uh, yeah, it's my 2013 Corolla, right? I'm thankful for it. It gets me from point A to point B. It gets great gas mileage. Currently, it gets like six months to a gallon uh, in, the, in the pandemic, in the lockdown. I'm loving it. Um, but y'all, I, I have my eyes on something bigger and better, right? I, have, I would love someday to be able to own a, a, a Ford or a, a Chevy pickup truck. And I know those two compete with each other. I, I really don't care. I just want a, a Ford or a Chevy pickup truck. That's like my dream, right, is, is to have one of those. So imagine if I'm, I'm out driving around in my Corolla and I pull up to a, a stoplight in the shady area of Aliso Viejo and I get carjacked, right? And somebody pulls me out of my car and they jump in my Corolla and they speed off and well, they drive off in my Corolla and I'm left there going, oh man, I just lost that. I can't believe I lost that. Man, I, I loved that car so much. But then imagine if I knew that sitting in my driveway back home, there was waiting for me a brand new Ford F-150 Raptor edition pickup truck. I wouldn't care about the Corolla. I'd be like, okay, well, that's gone. It served me well. I'm thankful for the time that I had it. I hope that guy comes to justice eventually who took it, but I'm going to go home and enjoy the thing that's even better than that. See, all that's, that's life under the sun versus life over the sun. Life under the sun is the Corolla. Life over the sun is the Raptor, right? It's, it's that thing that you're like, man, this is amazing. I can't believe this is mine. There's life that you can have that way, y'all. If you will repent from your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ and your Savior, you can have a life that's better than anything this world offers you. So you don't need to panic when there's a pandemic. You don't need to worry about what's going to happen to you tomorrow. You don't need to worry about your income. You don't need to worry about getting sick. God has you. He's got you. You're his son. You're his daughter. And he's not going to let you go. So get over what's under the sun. Solomon's train of thought continues in, uh, in verses 11 and 12. We're going to skip the center section. We'll come back to that. But jump down to verse 11 because he, he's continuing on this, this theme. He says, again, I saw what, what is done under the sun. The, the, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. For man does not know his time. 
like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Solomon is saying life, this life under the sun is unpredictable. You know, there are some things in life that we feel like are, are fairly certain that should be predictable, that should be uh, you know, dependable. The fastest contestant in a race, you imagine most of the time, is going to win the race. It should be pretty predictable, pretty certain. If Usain Bolt and I line up to run a 100-yard dash, I'm pretty certain 10 out of 10 times, he's going to just toast me. Even if he had like one leg tied to his opposite hand, I think he would still beat me in that race. He would beat my Corolla in that race, I know that. But if it were he and I, 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 he would blow me out of the water. It's pretty certain, it's pretty predictable. Or the strongest warrior winning the battle, it's pretty predictable. If I go up against some of our gatekeepers, right, that have former military training, and I try to, to pick a fight with one of them, if I go up against Danny Mayer, right, and I try to pick a fight with Danny Mayer, Danny's, Danny's going to win that battle. He's stronger, he's more equipped, he's a better trained warrior, and uh, my greatest defense is running from that. It's, it's almost certain. The wisest planner, right, is going to have his future securely provided for. You may have had parents growing up that were like, you need to start saving now. Start saving now for your car. Start saving now for your future home. Start saving now for retirement. And you're like, dude, I'm seven. What, what in the world? But the wisest planner, right, is going to have that secure future. They can bank on that. They know that it's certain. It's predictable. The smartest person is going to land a job with the biggest paycheck, right? You go to the best school. Why do you want to go to such a good school? So that you get the degree from the institution that's going to land you the best job. That's going to get you the, the best amount of money. That's what Solomon's saying. But he's turning it on its head. He's saying, but what I notice in life is quite the opposite. The race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. The bread doesn't go to the wise, to the ones that have prepared. The riches don't always go to the most intelligent. Uh, favor doesn't always go to those with knowledge. He says, but time and chance happen to them all. See, Solomon's watched in life and he's realized, you know what? Sometimes in a race, the, the fastest person trips and stumbles out of the gate and he doesn't win. And he says, that, that doesn't feel right because it doesn't feel like, like justice was done. The fastest person should win. And he says, but sometimes that doesn't happen. Or you think about uh, Solomon's dad, David, right? And I wonder if Solomon was reflecting on this as he was talking about the strongest warrior because sometimes the strongest warrior catches a rock between the eyes that was slung from a little shepherd boy, David and Goliath, right? The strongest warrior doesn't always win the battle. Or sometimes the, the, the planner, the person who saved up and invested uh, wisely throughout his whole life runs into a global pandemic like coronavirus that tanks the stock markets and all of a sudden he's no more better prepared than the person that squandered everything that he has. Or sometimes having the best education doesn't always land you the best job because you go in and you just have a bad interview. Or somebody who isn't as smart as you went in, but they had a great personality and they connected well with the, the boss and they get the job. See, Solomon's arguing here is that life and every day that it brings is unpredictable. He says time and chance happen to them all. That word chance is actually the word happenings. Time and happenings happen to everybody. Life happens. And then he returns to the suddenness of, of death once more at the end there. Man does not know his time like fish taken in an evil net and like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared in an evil time when it suddenly falls upon them. Again, he's talking about death there because death is the ultimate example of life happening, of just unpredictable events happening. We can't predict it like we've already talked about. And so what does that mean? Well, he wants us again, right, to get over the sun. And so as we look at the unpredictability of life under the sun, we need to understand that, that our response needs to be not to try to, to forget planning because we still need to plan. We still need to be wise, but we need to plan as the Lord wills and we need to set ourselves up as the, the Lord wills. But we need to, to, more than that, take every day as it comes as a gift from God to understand that we can't predict what this day is going to hold. We don't know the end of the day from the beginning of the day. We don't know lunch from breakfast, what's going to happen in our lives. And so we need to take every single day and live it humbly the way God wants us to live it. That's our second point this week. It's this. Humbly take each day as a gift from God. Humbly take each day as a gift from God. 
the humility comes into what Solomon's been talking about here. Life is unpredictable. And we need to not have the, the arrogance and the pride to say to ourselves or to think to ourselves that we know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. We can't predict what tomorrow's going to hold. Again, I, I go back to the, the beginning of all of this pandemic, before the lockdown, the day before the lockdown. What were your plans, your dreams for the next day, the next week, the next month, the next six months? What were your plans for this summer and how have those changed? And, and, and none of us knew that this was going to come. And so we need to take every single day as a gift from God and live it humbly before him, knowing the only thing that is certain is what he's called us to do, which is to live our lives in a way that pleases him, to live our lives for him, to live our lives to glorify him. David Gibson, who wrote a commentary on Ecclesiastes, uh, Living Life Backwards, it's a book, it's a great book, read it, get it, it's small, it's not Hebrew in, in technical languages, it's a devotional book. But Gibson says this, we all aspire to have everything, to know it all, do it all, achieve it all. These are what we want to do, to be happy forever, to have all the answers, to never be left scratching our head, to be remembered by all for all time. That's what we hope for. But what guarantee is there that we won't go under a bus tomorrow? If you knew that, you, if you knew that that would happen to you tomorrow, how would you live today? That, he says, is the whole point of Ecclesiastes. Again, death is the greatest example of the unpredictability of life. And so in light of that, how do you want to live? If you knew that you were going to die tomorrow, how would you change your life today? What would be different? What would you do? What would you not do? What thoughts would enter your mind? What thoughts would you entertain? This is the mindset that we should embrace. The only thing certain about your life under the sun is that eventually it's going to come to an end. And so the question before you is, how do you want to live your life right now? Our pride wants to revolt a little bit against Solomon here and go, okay, Solomon, but this is a little bit of an overreaction, isn't it? I mean, do I really need to think about every day could be my last day? Yes, we do. And when, when we say, well, I, I, I don't want to do that, that's our, our pride. That's, that's our arrogance creeping in, wanting to say, I want to be in control of my life. I'm not going to go under a bus tomorrow because I'm not going to go around any buses tomorrow. That's how I know that. Tomorrow's certain. Tomorrow's sure. I know that I'll make it to lunch. I know that I'll make it to dinner. But the reality is you don't. See, when you go and you walk through a, a, a graveyard and you look at the lives that were cut short, none of them planned to have their lives cut short. They simply were because death is indiscriminatory. Students, we all need to have the humility to take each day that God gives us as a gift and to live it for him. So how can you do that? A couple suggestions for you. Number one, begin every single day. Start every single day before you reach for your side table and you pick up your phone, before you get out of bed, before you brush your teeth, before anything else, begin every single day with a prayer of thanksgiving to God for giving you the day. It doesn't have to be long, it can be simple. God's not put off by your morning breath, so don't worry about it. He doesn't care about what your hair looks like. Don't worry about it. Pray. First thing you do, your eyes open. God, thank you for the day that you've given me today. I want to live it for you as long as I have today. Pray that way. Second, entrust the plans that you have for the day to the Lord. Again, that's, that's praying. That's going to the Lord to start your day saying, God, this, this is what's before me today. These are the plans that I have today, but I want to entrust them to you and say, if you will, God, this is what I want to do today. And so entrust your plans to the Lord. When you come through a day, another thing that you can do in this to take each day as a gift from God is to pray and thank him for the day that you just lived. Thank him for his goodness to you. Thank him for his kindness to you and allowing you to get in your car and to drive from point A to point B and to make it there safely. Thank him for providing the food that he provided for you that day. Thank him for the oxygen that you were able to breathe that day. So we need to give God more uh, gratitude, more thankfulness, more glory for the things that he's done for us than we do. And we can do that at the end of every single day as we look back. And then this final point here is, is I think probably the most important one, and that's this. Go to sleep ready not to wake up. Go to sleep ready not to wake up. It's like that old children's prayer. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, right? We need to be ready to die when we go to sleep. Because the only reason we're going to wake up is God's goodness and grace in our life. David said in, in the early chapters of Psalm, I can't remember if it's Psalm 3 or Psalm 4, Psalm 3 or Psalm 4. He said, I lay down and slept and I awoke for the Lord sustained me. The only reason you wake up in the morning is because God's 
goodness, because he sustained your body, because he sustained how your, your body operates. And so you need to go to sleep right with the Lord, making sure that, yes, you're saved. But then at the end of every day, it's a good practice to get into, to examine the day behind you and say, okay, is there anywhere where I sinned against God where I just need to confess my sin before him? Yes, my sin is forgiven by Christ at the cross, but I just want to make sure that, that I don't die with anything that, that is, is not confessed. I don't want to shrink from shame when I stand before the Lord. I, I want to be ready to meet my Savior face to face. And so spend that time at the end of each day uh, thinking about your day and go to sleep ready not to wake up. This is, guys, this has James written all over it. As we studied together last year, James 4, 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Man, how well do we know that now in the midst of this pandemic? We do not know what tomorrow will bring. Even now, when is the, the, the phase, phased opening going to start? Is that going to start tomorrow? I don't know. Is there going to be a, another shoe that's going to fall tomorrow? Are the restrictions going to go back in place? Is there going to be more restrictions tomorrow? What's going to happen? We don't know. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. And then he gets, says this, For what is your life? For you are a mist that appears, a vapor. Wow, does that sound familiar? Ecclesiastes, you are a vapor. You are, are here for a little time and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. See, the, the writer here, Solomon, is, is encouraging us what James is encouraging us to do. Realize that life is unpredictable, that you don't know. Sometimes the swift don't win the race. Sometimes the strongest don't win the battle. Sometimes the most prepared are left unprepared. That's life. Sometimes death comes out of the blue. That's the unpredictability of it. You can't bank on anything. And so what you need to do is you need to live each day as a gift from God and not assume or presume and not be bold and, and, and arrogant in our planning. Yes, to plan, but to plan the way James tells us to. To say, okay, God, if you will, this is what my plans are. And I'm entrusting them. I'm giving them to you. I'm going to live this life under the sun, ready for life over the sun. And as I do, I'm going to take each day as a gift from you. So what does that actually look like, though? In the interim, in the middle of the time of life between birth and death, when it comes to this, this question of, of how should we then live that we keep coming back to? Well, let's jump back to verse 7. We're back in the middle of the section, that section that we s- skipped over. If the answer isn't nihilistic despair, and yet at the same time, it's, it's not to invest all that we are in value in this life because it, it's going to leave us disappointed in the end, what should we do then? Verse 7 through 10. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. Grape juice. For God has already approved what you do. Let your garments always be white. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given to you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might for there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom and shield to which you are going. Solomon starts out there with go, right? Go. He doesn't say, stay there, sit on a a mound of ashes and sackcloth and heap dust on your head and say, woe is me and the life is horrible and uh, don't become a nihilistic philosopher is what Solomon is saying here. Don't become stoic, don't become passive, don't just retreat. He says, go and get about living your life is what he's saying. Go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart for God has already approved what you do. Go and get busy living. Solomon's already addressed this for us back in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 26. There's nothing better, he says, for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his work, in his toil, in his labors. Why? This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. See, the answer is not to to despair of life. The answer is not to look at everything that might make you happy sideways and suspecting. No, the answer is to enjoy the life that God has given you to enjoy. To do so, taking every single day as a a gift from God. And as you live that day, as you live it moment by moment in trust and faith and confidence in Him, feel free to enjoy the things that He's given you. Man, pick up a, a hamburger and eat that hamburger and enjoy the taste of it for the glory of God, right? Grab a milkshake and drink that for the glory of God. 
Watch a baseball game and enjoy that if that's your shtick like it is mine. And enjoy that for the glory of God. These are, are, are okay things to do. You don't have to be, again, this, this, uh, this stoic, this, uh, this ascetic, this, this monk that retreats and just lives in a cave with nothing but a candle and a Bible and says, well, this is my life. Now, that's not what he's driving at here. God wants you to enjoy the, the life that you have. He wants you to live the life that you have. But he says, as he goes on back in our, our passage again, he says, but let your garments be white always. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that's your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. When he says, let your garments be white, he's talking about our, our purity there. He's talking about, yes, this is the life that you should live. Feel free to enjoy life, get busy living, but live life in a way that pleases the Lord in a way that's going to keep you unstained from the, the sinfulness in the world. He says, if you're married, enjoy the life that, that God has given you. That's a blessing. That's a good thing in life. It's another example. He's, he's talked about food and drink, and now he holds out marriage. It's something that's enjoyable and that's good. It's not as though you're supposed to get married and go, well, this is supposed to be sanctifying for me, so I guess I'm in this for another 50 years, and if the Lord wills, and, and ball and chain, and everything else like that. No. Solomon's going, enjoy marriage. Enjoy it. It's, it's a good thing to be pleased with your wife, to enjoy your wife, to have a good, strong, happy marriage. Have a family. Enjoy your family. There's nothing wrong with that. Work hard. Enjoy your work because God has given you that task, he says, under the sun. The problem is when we make that everything. When we make that under the sun, everything. Instead, we need to understand it's not everything. But while I'm here under the sun, I'm going to do everything I can to live this life to the fullest, to enjoy it to the fullest in a way that pleases and honors God. That's our final point this week is this. Live with all your might while you do live. Live with all your might while you do live. With everything in you. With all you are. I love what Solomon says there. He says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Do it with your might, for there's no work, thought, knowledge, or wisdom, and shield to which you are going. Students, that's your task. Your task is to, to find something that you enjoy doing and to do it with every fiber of your being, as long as it's something that pleases God, as long as it's something that's not sinful, that's not wrong, that's not evil. If it's something that's good, if you've got a, a, a job that's a, a good job, awesome. Do it with all your might in a way that pleases God. If you uh, play a sport and you enjoy that, praise God. Do it with all your might in a way that pleases God. If you enjoy cooking, awesome. Do it with all your might in a way that pleases God. Enjoy the food you cook with all your might in a way that pleases God. God doesn't want you as some half-hearted being just walking around this world kind of going, okay, well, Ecclesiastes, we studied it, and now look at me. I'm just here to float around until I get over the sun, and here I am. No, that's, that's not it at all. Get busy living your life. Christians should be some of the most vibrant, passionate, exciting people to be around in this world because of this very idea. We understand that we can live with all our might while we're here because there's a, a life that's far better that's coming. And so while we're here, we're going to wait for that. We're going to take every day as a gift from God. And we're going to live with every fiber of our being and enjoy the gifts that he gives us here and now. I mean, think about it. If God wanted us to be just passionless, why would he create the things that he created? Why would he have created the oceans with the roaring waves and the, the sparkling waters? Why would he do that? If he didn't want us to enjoy that and to be in awe of him and to say, wow, God, praise you. I, God, you are amazing to have been able to create that. Why did God create the sheer walls of Zion that we saw if you were with us uh, at our, our retreat? Why did God create any of that if, if he didn't want us to look at it and be in awe of him and, and, and wonder and enjoy that? Why did he create the sun to display such brilliant colors in the sky when it sets and when it rises? If he didn't want us to be able to enjoy that. Why did he create the stars in the night sky and spread them out like a blanket? If he didn't want us to look up and to be in awe and in wonder of the stars and to, to praise him and to worship him for that. Why did God create us with the capacity to love? To feel those butterflies in our stomach when we're around somebody that we, were, we like, that we have a, a crush on. Why did God create us with that capacity? if he didn't want us to enjoy that? Why did God create us with the capacity to, to have relationships with people, to have friendships with people, if he didn't want us to enjoy that? Why did God create a, a job that presents a, a sense of satisfaction when you've done it well, when you've worked a long day or finished a project, if he didn't want us to, 
find jo- enjoyment and happiness in that. All those things. Does God want us to just greet those things with a stoic, thanks God, appreciate it? No, not at all, right? He wants you to enjoy them to the fullest extent that you can enjoy them. And he wants that to lead you to glorify him. He doesn't want that to lead you to just be satisfied in the thing, satisfied in the gifts, satisfied in the job, satisfied in the beauty, satisfied in the relationship. No, he wants the the thing, the beauty, the, the relationship, the thing that he created to then direct your gaze and your thought to him. He wants you to glorify him as you live for all your might on this earth. And that's the way that we handle this life, where we live under the sun for what's over the sun, is by doing those things. Getting over the sun isn't some version of Hinduism and Buddhism where we try to leave everything in this world behind, including all feeling and joy and and, and knowledge. It's not that at all. It's that we live this life for the Lord. We live with all of our might and we enjoy the things that he gives us to enjoy. And we understand that this life is unpredictable. That tomorrow's not guaranteed for me. So while I have today, better is a living dog than a dead lion. I'm going to live today with all my might for the glory of God. And if tomorrow I'm gone, so be it. I know where I'm going. I'm going over the sun to be with him. And there's nothing greater than that. This is the key, y'all, to living a life that's not summed up by the phrase, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So you see where Solomon's pivoted now. Yes, this has been a lot about death in this chapter again, but it's, it's now directing us to, okay, how do we respond? Now we're answering that question, how should we then live? And Solomon's doing that for us by encouraging us to live for what's over the sun. This chapter is hopeful for me. It's encouraging for me. It's challenging for me. That now as I go home, I want to love my family well. I want to play with my kids. I want to enjoy my Corolla, right, for the glory of God because he's given it to me. You know, I want to do these things for his glory. I want to work hard for his glory. I want to work hard and I want to take every single day as a gift from him. No, and it's not guaranteed for me. But I want to be able to do that with the great confidence in knowing that I'm living for what's over the sun, and that is guaranteed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this truth. We thank you for this text. We thank you for this passage. We thank you, God, that what is under the sun is not all there is, but that there is life over the sun with you. And that's the life that you have secured for us through Christ that you have sent Jesus to be our Savior, that he has died on the cross to forgive our sins, that he has risen from the dead, and that we too will one day rise to be with him in glory as well. Lord, we long for that day, we look for that day, and we pray, Lord, come quickly and usher that day in in our lives. But in the meantime, Lord, may we be found faithful to you to take each day as you give it to us as a gift from you and to live that day with all our might while we do live here under the sun waiting for the return of Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.